rights lawyer Jeffrey Robertson QC has just released a new book about the Armenian massacre called An Inconvenient Genocide. And he joins us now. Jeffrey, thanks for coming back. Hi. Uh, explain to us, first of all, the link between the Anzacs landing at Gallipoli in 1915 and the Armenian genocide. Well, it is a direct link because this genocide started, as a lot of genocides do, with the killing of the intellectuals, the community leaders in Constantinople, which is now Istanbul. And they were killed on the 24th of April, 1915. Ring a bell? The night before the Anzac landing at Gallipoli. And that was used as an excuse, as a cover, to get rid of more than half of the Armenian population of about two million because it had long been festering. The Ottoman Turks had massacred Armenians before. They had started a campaign in which they boasted of their own superiority and educated children to look down on the Armenians. They treated them very much as the Nazis treated the Jews. And there is a, quite a similarity between the two genocides. So now, the, the Turks say it's not a genocide. They say it was a, they re it's a not relocation. A, they what did your research Well, show? relocation, I researched the facts, and there is no doubt that relocation is one of those euphemisms that you get in genocidal states. Uh, the Nazis used the word evacuation. We're evacuating the Jew Jews to the east. The Turks used relocation. We're simply relocating them. What they did was to force old men and all the women and the children to march for hundreds of miles through the burning Syrian desert to places that we only know now because ISIS is in the middle of occupying them. And more than half, about three quarters of those, that million people, were actually died. They died from some, some of them were actually attacked, others died from starvation because they weren't provided with food, others died from typhus in the concentration camps outside Aleppo. So it was under any view of genocide, and I've been a, a United Nations judge, and what I've done in this book is to apply the law, or the law incidentally that Doc Ebert was instrumental in bringing down at the United Nations in 1948, to the actual facts that occurred in 1915. And so, there is no doubt that it was, in legal terms, a genocide. So what do you think should be done about it now? Well, I think this is the one genocide where there have been no reparations, there's been no apology. Uh, I think Turkey has to face the fact they're pretending that it wasn't a crime at all. They're pretending that it was military necessity. But it wasn't military necessity to march uh, hundreds of thousands of people to their death. We know, as Australians, all about death marches from Samarkand. And uh, I think Turkey has to accept, if it won't use the G word, that at least it was a crime against humanity of quite massive proportions. Uh, it's never been requited. There have been no reparations. I think there should be some... There are a thousand uh, Christian Armenian churches that could be restored. I would actually, I've advocated in my book that the way of making amends would be to cede to the little uh, country of Armenia the great magical mountain that overlooks its capital, uh, Mount Ararat, it, where, uh, where Noah's Ark is uh, meant to be. And that would be an appropriate way. On the 100th anniversary of the genocide, the day before the uh, 100th anniversary of Anzac Day to, uh, to actually make that reparation. But of course Turkey does want to have a bar of this. Is this now the time to be pressing Turkey and antagonising Turkey at a time when they're helping uh, the US with their, with their bases in a, to fight ISIS? Another organisation, another group hell-bent on, on genocide? Well, it's a difficult time to tell the truth. That's why I've called my book An Inconvenient Genocide. Uh, President Obama in the campaign trail in 2008 says it was clearly genocide and I'm going to call it that when I'm president. He hasn't dared to utter the G-word because we're dependent on Turkish bases. But I would like to see, at least in the immediate future, at least next year, that some representative from the Australian Parliament, I wouldn't say Fred Nile, we're not 
always on the same side, and I think they've got to be careful of a, a sort of Christian bias there. But I would like to see, with all the politicians that are going to Gallipoli, at least one representative of the Australian government going to Yerevan and saying, not as Julie Bishop says, this was a great tragedy. All right. It wasn't a tragedy, it was a crime. Chris Berg has got a question. Chris? Yeah, I'm interested in, um, in what is the significance of the threshold question, Rosa? What, what matters when you call it a genocide? Like, it quite clearly, in my view, was. But what's the significance of calling it a genocide as opposed to just a massive series of atrocities or, as you say, a crime against humanity? Why, why does it specifically matter that we call it genocide as okay, opposed to I'm um, sorry, Geoffrey couldn't hear Chris's question, but Chris was asking the question, why does it matter that we call it a genocide? Well, it matters... First of all, to the victims, relatives, they're still around. There were a couple of hundred-year-old women who met President Obama last year with the world's most famous Armenian, uh, Kim Kardashian. <laughs> and they, uh, because they see themselves as victims of genocide, uh, I lost, I wasn't born, but I lost a grand-uncle or two at uh, Gallipoli. He was shot lawfully by a Turkish soldier. But being a victim of genocide is different. It is the worst of crimes, and it is a crime that requires reparation. And so I think it is worthy of uh, being called a genocide. It is a genocide, technically. We have a genocide convention, which almost all countries have ratified, that requires reparations, and which establishes that these people were not just victims of war, they were victims of an attempt to destroy their race. And it matters so much today when we have ISIS with its genocidal intent, killing Christian communities, killing Shia communities and so forth, that we do reserve a particularly heinous place, the worst crime in the world, because it's so easy to stir up, it's so easy for governments to stir up, because we've seen it. We've seen it in Sri Lanka, we've seen it in Bangladesh, we've seen it in a number of other countries, that we do reserve this name and this special obligation on states to make reparation to uh, crimes that are, in, a sen in essence, the determination to destroy part of a people for racial or religious okay. reasons. Jeffrey Robinson, we've run out of time. Thanks very much for coming on. Yeah.